This week we're just up the road in Ashburn, Virginia, visiting Heckler & Koch's Grey Room, a private company museum somewhat shrouded in mystery because access is very limited. Now housed inside are firearms and platforms, both legacy and from the current catalog, that showcase where the company has been and where it's going today. H&K was formed in 1949 in the village of Obendorf. It's been a center of German gun making for many, many years. Uh, its reputation really became enhanced in the late 1800s when the Mauser brothers started the Mauser factory in the same village. Mauser was shut down in 1949 and uh, initially two, later three, former Mauser employees started Heckler & Koch. Initially we were an engineering company, then we later branched into manufacturing. Uh, we did sewing machine parts, we did bicycle parts, things of that nature. Uh, the big change happened in 1959 when we received the contract to make the G3 rifle for the newly reformed German military, uh, the Bundeswehr. You know, after they started making the G3, that their, their bicycle part days were over. They never sold their bicycle part again, and they were just churning out G3s. And then you look you know, at, the, at the line of, of shoulder fire weapons from, from H&K over the years, all up until about the late 90s, they were all iterated based off of that same basic roller delayed system in the G3. You know, it spun off various um, long guns and sub guns and, and, and even a handgun model were based off that same basic technology. Um, but it's super interesting. You know, there's a lot of gun companies out there that, that they can point to a certain gun that put them on the map. For HK, it was the very first gun they made that put them on the map. The roller delayed blowback system was the centerpiece of h &K shoulder fired small arms production. Uh, for almost 40 years. Again, you have to go back to World War II where they wanted to adopt a blowback system for use with rifle caliber cartridges. On a simple blowback or inertial blowback system, you are using the weight and mass of the bolt and to a lesser extent the inertia of the recoil spring to hold the bolt into battery the short time it takes for the projectile to exit the muzzle. Prior to that, with simple or inertia blowback, you're normally limited to pistol cartridges only, the nine millimeter .45 ACP. So the roller delay blowback was a method to attempt to use the simplicity of the blowback design with center fire rifle cartridges such as 7.62 and 5.56. Basically what had to be incorporated was a mechanical disadvantage or a mechanical delay designed to accept the heavier impulse or recoil of a, of a 7.62 cartridge. So you think of the roller delay blowback as a lever transpose transmission system in which the, uh, the bolt head that has the rollers right over there uses those rollers as an energy vector to transfer the energy to two distinct points inside the receiver. By the mid-1960s, uh, production began to taper off as we fulfilled our contractual obligation to the German military. As such, we had to look for new opportunities for business. So one of the first attempts at that was to neck the 762 by 51 G3 down to a 9mm platform. This, of course, resulted in the MP5, one of our most iconic and famous uh, products. Uh, later on in the 1960s, we developed the HK32 and HK33 assault rifles, so 762 by 39 and 556 by 45 respectively. Uh, also during this time, the, uh, the belt-fed and magazine-fed machine gun family was introduced, uh, followed up in the 70s and 80s by the MSG-90 and the PSG-1 marksman's rifles. Bill, we're looking at a couple firearms here uh, that appear to be very similar. This is the MP5K, really a staple of that HK lineup and uh, really evokes a lot of those feelings of the Cold War clandestine operations, uh, fully automatic firearm, um, and it's just got that, that HK classic roller delayed blowback operating system. This is really a staple of the HK lineup. If, if there is a symbol of the mystique of the HK brand, it is the, it is the MP5K. But of course, being a fully automatic, in terms of me owning one, that's a little bit a uh, tricky situation. Yeah, if you wanted a pre-band model of an MP5 of any kind, you're looking at a, a lot of money. You've got to be independently wealthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and plenty of forms to go along with it. But you've got a new model. Sure. This is the SP5K. Uh, it's basically a semi-automatic version of the MP5K. It's actually existed in Europe for a few years called the SP89, but just for the U.S. market, we decided to call it the SP5K just because we're so enamored by the romance of the MP5. Right. So um, it's got a few minor differences 
um, in it. Uh, the biggest one here is uh, in the selector switch. Obviously, you've got safe and single fire. There's no fully automatic mode to it. And the, everything about the gun just exudes coolness. I mean, just the sounds it makes and, and the, you know, it's just, I'm ready for the movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, in the 1970s, work began on the replacement for the G3. This was a revolutionary system called the G11. Revolutionary in the terms that it was to employ caseless ammunition technology. There are actually three companies that were associated with this program. H&K was to develop the hardware, the gun. Dynamite Nobel was responsible for the ammunition. And then Hensolt was responsible for the carrying handle slash optical unit. Uh, this fired at a very, very high cyclic rate, uh, mainly because going from an eight-step cycle of operation that included the extraction and ejection, you went down to a six-step cycle of operation that, because the uh, propellant uh, encapsulated the projectile and was consumed during the ignition process. So we didn't have a brass or a steel cartridge case associated with the design of the projectile. Uh, there was a lot of technical issues involved with this gun, protracted development. Uh, in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell down, and kind of the reason or the justification for the G11 also disappeared as well. But this still left the German military with the 762 by 51 G3 at this time that were becoming old and in need of replacement. Also, by this time, most of the NATO countries had switched over to the lighter and smaller 556 cartridge. So, the G36 was an attempt to meet German Army requirements for a simple, lightweight, gas operated gun, again, employing the 5.56 by 45 caliber cartridge. In a major departure for H&K, we went to a rotary bolt locking system and a short stroke gas system to operate the gun. So really the first fundamental change since 1959 when we developed the G3 as far as the design of both the locking system and the operating system. So, you know, what started with, with the G3 or what started with bicycle parts um, has now grown into this global uh, small arms business that really HK's footprint um, really expands across the globe and that includes the United States. A key part of, of HK's DNA has been that innovation. Um, and even when HK has followed whatever consumer trends were out there in calibers, they've kind of spun off and done things in their, in their own way on the military side of this. We plan to continue to do that. And I think on the consumer business, we tend to follow uh, trends and fashions within the firearms industry and improve on them and do it in an HK way um, that's within our DNA. And then we plan to white sheet some new products that, that solve problems in a very, very unique way that, that nobody else has ever thought of.